Hello, I'm Peter Salis. I'm a patron of the Macula Society. Like half a million people in the UK, I have macular disease. I know what it's like to be told you have this condition, and this film will explain what macular disease is, why it occurs, what can be done to treat it medically, and what other help is available. And there is help out there. You are not alone. I used to be a GP uh, and worked in uh, Wolverhampton uh, for many years. I um, was diagnosed with uh, bilateral uh, dry uh, age-related macular uh, degeneration um, in 2005. They took a look and they said, um, y yes, your optician's right, you've got macular degen degeneration. Do you know anything about it? I said, no, I've never heard the name of it before. They sort of told me that I'd got macular disease and um, I'd probably be completely blind in five years' time and there was nothing they could do. To suddenly be told by the consultant that there was nothing could be done and you were just dropped with a year's appointment. But my wife was an absolute rock and she, typical Midlander, basically just wouldn't accept that nothing could be done and we got in touch with the local rehabilitation officer. We discovered a local macular society group, which was excellent, and we got involved with that. And basically, by trial and error, um, we found out that there's a whole network of stuff out there. No matter who you are, even if you're a doctor, a diagnosis of macular disease can be bewildering. Sometimes people leave an eye clinic thinking that they will go completely blind or that there is no help for people with MD. Neither of those beliefs is true, as this film will show. But let's start at the beginning. What is macular disease? Here's Professor Simon Harding. Most people, I think, know that the retina lines the back of the eye, and that's the light-sensitive tissue which converts light into the messages of sight which pass from the eye through to the brain. The macula is the central part of the retina, which is where fine vision is located, and that's the area that you use for reading, writing, watching television and recognising people's faces. And so you can see that if the macula degenerates, all those parts of the vision that you take for granted, which are important for daily life, become affected. Age-related macular degeneration comes in two main types, the dry form and the wet form. In the dry form, the pigment cells under the retina die off and uh, this causes a slow, gradual reduction of vision, usually over many years. In wet macular degeneration, new vessels form. Those blood vessels leak fluid, bleed and scar. And that combination of fluid, bleeding and scarring takes away the central vision. That loss of central vision can occur quite rapidly, often over a few weeks. Um, and usually affects both eyes, although one eye tends to be affected before the other. About 5% of people with dry macular degeneration go on to develop wet macular degeneration. So what causes MD? And why is it that some people get it and others don't? We're gradually building up a picture of the causes and the risk factors. It is now clear that genes play an important part in macular disease. Two genes in particular have been identified. People with a copy of both these genes from each parent have a 98% chance of developing MD. But there are other risk factors too. The older you are, the more likely you are to develop MD. Most people with macular disease are over 65. There's a strong link between smoking and MD. A poor diet may increase the risk of MD. High blood pressure and cardiovascular disease have been linked to MD. And so has high exposure to ultraviolet light. There are also genetic macular conditions affecting younger people. They're all very rare and are often just described as juvenile macular dystrophy. 
Sometimes they're given specific names, such as Stargardt's disease or Sorsby's fundus dystrophy. All forms of macular disease have similar symptoms. The first obvious symptom is usually blurred vision. This can happen very gradually, and if only one eye is affected, a person may not notice for some time. And color vision can deteriorate too, and gradually the central vision is lost, so that eventually only the peripheral vision is intact. This is typical of dry macular degeneration. Some people can suddenly notice that their vision is distorted. Straight lines become bent or wavy, or there may be gaps in the vision. This is a sign of the development of wet macular degeneration and should be treated as an emergency. A person may already have dry macular degeneration and then develop the wet form in the same eye or wet MD symptoms may be the first they notice. Some conditions affecting younger people are also wet forms of macular degeneration. So anyone with these symptoms should see an optician or an eye doctor as soon as possible because there is now treatment for wet MD, but it needs to be given quickly if it is to be effective. In recent years, a number of treatments have started to become available for macular degeneration but only at the moment for the wet or neovascular form. As yet, there is no treatment for the dry form of macular degeneration. One of the important things to understand, though, is that treatment for wet macular degeneration is only effective in the relatively early stages of the disease. And I'm afraid that if you have had wet macular degeneration for more than 12 months or so, none of the treatments that are currently available are effective. This is why anyone noticing a sudden change in their vision should go to an optician. If wet macular degeneration is suspected, you should be referred immediately to a retinal specialist at a hospital. You should not be sent back to a GP. Family doctors are not trained to deal with macular disease. In the case of wet macular degeneration, fast treatment is vital. So referral to anyone other than a retinal specialist will cause delay. Even if you have had wet macular degeneration for a long time, it is still possible to have a new episode which might be treatable. So you should always be vigilant about monitoring your vision. Damage to the eye caused by dry macular degeneration or long-standing wet macular degeneration cannot at the moment be treated. Some people with wet macular degeneration will be offered a form of laser treatment, but the more usual treatment now is with a drug injected into the eye to stop the formation of new blood vessels. The treatment is not a miracle cure, but it does help to maintain vision in most people who have it. The injections are given in hospital every four to six weeks. Naturally, at first, some patients are worried about having an injection in the eye. They're usually quite disturbed by the fact it's an eye injection to begin with, but once they realise that they're going to have local anaesthetic drops and they're going to be well prepared, we take them through the whole procedure and then um, they go into an injection room, which is non-threatening really because it's a small room, it's not an operating theatre and we introduce that to them beforehand if necessary because some people are very nervous about having a needle put directly into the eye. Lots of people think it's actually going to go into the eyeball directly through you know, the pupil area and that's not the case, it's to the side. They also envisage that they're going to see the needle you know, going into the eye and that's not the case either. Most patients, um, when they've had the procedure, don't realise actually that it's finished because it's such a quick Excellent. injection. All of the time is spent with preparation, really. So um, we've never had anybody here not come back because the injection was too painful to tolerate. It's more the thought of the injection process. Since about uh, October 2007, I've had uh, injections each month, either one eye or the other or both, um, and I've had both done today, and uh, there is no doubt that the, the treatment I'm having has managed to retain okay, so the sight that I had eye. in my left eye. 
and uh, is probably helping now towards retaining some vision in my right eye. Originally, you're marginally concerned about people injecting into your eye. Um, after the first time, when they numb your eyeball by drops, it deadens your eye, so you can't feel very much. There is no sensation of pain whatsoever. Um, you're aware that your eye is open and can't be closed, and that it's numb. But as for pain, there is none at all. Whether or not your macular degeneration is treatable, you should still have regular eye examinations to check the health of your eye not just your sight. Dry macular degeneration can become wet. And of course you may develop other eye or health conditions that could be treatable. You can help yourself by checking your own vision regularly with an Amsler grid, which can help detect changes in your vision. Hold the grid at normal reading distance, cover one eye and stare at the spot in the center of the grid. If you have macular disease, parts of the grid may be wavy, distorted or missing. Check both eyes, and if you think your vision has changed, have an eye examination straight away. Regular testing is just one way that you can protect your sight. Here are some more. If you smoke, stop. Take regular exercise to help control your blood pressure and protect your cardiovascular system. Wear good quality sunglasses to filter out UV light and save your eyes from glare and wear a brimmed hat outside, even on cloudy days. You should also eat well. It's increasingly believed that diet plays a significant part in eye health. The eye requires uh, uh, nutrients from diet uh, to protect it uh, from the ravages of day-to-day -day living. We now know that in AMD patients that they have low levels of key micronutrients that we get in our day-to-day -day diet from fruit and vegetables. One of the key nutrients is called lutein. And it, lutein is a plant dye that is found in particularly large amounts in green leafy vegetables like spinach and like kale but it's also present in foods like uh, uh, fruit and sweet corn. What is not a question at all is that the only source of lutein we have, our bodies can't manufacture it, so the only source that we have naturally is from our diet. So if we uh, take in lots of fruit and vegetables, then we get uh, a reasonable level of lutein. If we don't eat fruit and vegetables, we are deficient in lutein. And, and that is dangerous for, for the development and the progress of AMD. What we really don't understand is if we super increase the amount of lutein, whether that makes any extra benefit. Uh, and that's a question that's out to study at the moment in very large trials going on in Europe and America. One big trial in America did find that large doses of some vitamins and zinc can help people with advanced macular degeneration. And for that reason, some, though not all doctors, do recommend supplements. Well, supplements have their place. I never think that they should be a substitute for a good diet. Uh, that, that's one thing from the outset. But they do give an opportunity to give a real boost to some of these uh, uh, vitally important antioxidants that we do need in our diet. The Macular Society has useful leaflets about nutrition and other ways you can help protect your vision. While self-help is important in coping with macular disease, there's a lot of other help available too. Low vision experts help people to make the most of their sight. Your local social services department Eye Clinic or Blind Society will know where your nearest centre is. This one is in Birmingham. Patients can often be told there's nothing more that can be done, and that may be true as far as the hospital uh, medical uh, services are concerned, as far as the eye is concerned. Um, 
and uh, but that is really the beginning point and there's plenty that can be done as far as low vision is concerned so it's really the beginning point of, of low vision services and, and where we can step in and try and help. We're here to look at anyone with visual impairment and try and make the most out of the, the vision that's remaining. So from the low vision clinic which where I work we're looking at uh, magnifiers uh, and aids to make the most of, of people's remaining sight. Elsewhere on site here we have a resource uh, shop where people can look at uh, aids to help them with in daily living. So it's got a camera and it's taking a picture of it and I can drive it up or down depending on the size that I need to read with. They're two different sizes. Cool. I lose that one though. Yeah. That's yeah. almost too big for me. Yeah. And that's better. Oh, well, I can see that one. Yeah, can you see that one? There is a wide range of low vision aids and high tech equipment from simple handheld magnifiers to sophisticated computers and camera readers. A low vision expert can advise on what is most useful to you. Good advice about simple things, such as the lighting in your home, can improve a person's quality of life enormously. And particularly with macular disease problems, lighting can make a huge difference in terms of not only reading, because people often look at lighting in terms of helping them read more, but, but also with other things within the kitchen, for example, at home, maybe it's sort of making a cup of tea, buttering a slice of bread. Uh, good directional lighting can make a huge difference in how easy these tasks are. It's knowing where to go and where... Uh, the facilities are available. So in terms of lighting, knowing what sort of light would help, looking at different aids, what suits one person doesn't suit another person. Each person has a different need, but you have to, with the help of professionals, explore what's best for you. If no one suggests you should have low vision advice, you can ask to be referred to a low vision service yourself. If you're having problems reading, or doing everyday tasks. If your sight loss is significant, you can be registered as sight impaired or severely sight impaired. This can entitle you to certain benefits and in some areas is the mechanism for accessing help from social services. Your hospital consultant has to complete the registration form. There's also a form of training which can help people with macular disease make better use of their remaining peripheral vision. It's called eccentric viewing because it doesn't rely on the central vision. The Macular Society's volunteers run training sessions and so do some other organizations. The training helps people to identify the part of their retina which is working best and then helps them to change the way they look and read to bring that part of the retina into the center of their vision. Can you really yeah. focus where those two lines cross, where I'm showing, putting my pointer, and tell me, with your point with your finger, where you think the clearest part of that grid is? By actually concentrating on the middle, on that, which part yeah. of that grid is clearest the to light, you? The right, the right. This area around there. here? Yeah. Okay. Light is essential. You're, the best light is just below your eyes so it doesn't blind you. You just hold them up here like that and you put the page along with your eye up and you can read what's there. It's absolutely wonderful. It doesn't work for everyone, but it's very valuable to those who can master the technique. This makes your life independent. You don't have to wait in your family coming up till you read everything for you. You can read your own letters, you can read instructions, you can read guarantees. If you want to have an argument about your electricity bill or something like that, you've got the reference and you can go to town on them. It makes you independent. You're leading a normal life. I didn't mind giving up the car. I didn't mind not being able to play golf. I didn't mind that so much. But I did mind was not being able to, to read. Now, there are audio books, there are cassettes, uh, there are various scanners, but it's not the same as simply picking up a book. Now, I'll never be able to read the same way as a sighted person can read. I, I'll never be able to simply just browse and scan, but I still can pick up a book and read it myself. I can read my own mail, I can read the own letters, and that's very, very empowering. You can find out more about low vision help, eccentric viewing, and a great deal else from the Macular Society helpline.
The helpline is often the first port of call for people newly diagnosed with MD. People assume all sorts of, or fear all sorts of things. They, they don't know what's going to happen to them. Um, they think their life could be coming to an end almost. It's, it's everything's going to be different. And very often it's a, a stage later in life when they're dealing with lots of other things as well. So what we want to do is to, first of all, listen to them and find out what it is, what their concerns are, and then talk through with them um, and, and address those particular areas, and okay, also maybe um, give them information, the that questions that, that they've not thought about yet. The Society also has a free telephone counselling service for anyone with macular degeneration. You can find out more by calling the helpline. Both the helpline and counselling services frequently hear from people with an unexpected and sometimes alarming side effect of sight loss, visual hallucinations. It's a phenomenon called Charles Bonnet syndrome, after the 17th century natural scientist who first described it. The most important thing to remember about it is that it is not a disorder of the mind, but a normal response of the brain to loss of vision. We know that when we lose vision, the nerve impulses from the, 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 the camera part of our eye, from the retina, uh, decrease to the brain, and the brain cells then fire off when they shouldn't do. And uh, it's that spontaneous firing off of cells in the brain that causes the hallucinations. There were people going across a, a crossing outside the local hospital and all of a sudden, it looked as, to me as though there were cars coming and crossing the, the crossing there as well, knocking people flying. Um, I nearly screamed, but suddenly realised that nobody else was taking any, any notice of it, and they were just carrying on talking or walking or whatever, as though there was nothing happening. And then I looked away and looked back again, and it had all gone. It's not a sign of uh, mental illness or, or uh, dementia or any other sort of mental problem. It's, it's something that all of us can do if we lose our sight. I really did think, what on earth's the matter with me? I, thought, I, I just didn't, at that time, connect it up with the eyesight problem. And I did get a bit frightened, but I didn't mention it to anybody because I thought they'd think I was daft, silly, stupid, whatever. A typical hallucination will be relatively straightforward. It'll be of a, a pattern, a tapestry perhaps, or brickwork or latticework. And most patients that have Charles Bonnet syndrome will describe an experience of that sort. About half of them go on to have more complex experiences. I'm an artist <laughs> and I was up in my studio and I suddenly noticed things interfering with my vision. Um, the initial ones were slightly abstract, slightly latticey, but rum, uh, jumbled up, not a, not a regular lattice pattern image. And um, I was a little bit concerned, and uh, being an artist, I thought, well, I'll do some pictures of them, um, which I did. And as I say, this, this is, is the first one I did. I did have other images of um, what are called gargoyle heads, which is um, this one here, and uh, various sort of heads like that, and in black and white, strangely. Charles Bonnet syndrome hallucinations tend to occur in a state of drowsy wakefulness, so when you're sitting in a chair, um, not not falling asleep, but sort of relaxing. And so if you arouse yourself by walking around, making a cup of tea or something, that sometimes breaks the hallucinations. Uh, putting the lights on if they're off, or, or switching them off if they're on, changing some form of well, ambient lighting condition step. sometimes helps as well. Um, and sometimes people describe simply opening or closing their eyes. Uh, in effect, changing the light conditions can also stop them. It is important that, that, that people do, if they have anything like this at all, I would say that the best source to go to initially is the Macular Society. That is their area. They have their specialists, etc., who can um, advise them as to what information to give people, and they are very helpful. Many people don't talk about their hallucinations, 
and it can be a great relief to discover that others have similar experiences. And in general, meeting and talking to other people with macular disease can be invaluable. The Macular Society has support groups around the country. Joining a group can be a therapy in itself. It's very important. You realise you're not the only one out there, that there's a lot of us all with the same. And I think all the information you get from side view and the digest is really useful, you know. I knew somebody from Age Concern. I phoned him up and asked, asked him if I could come yes. or to come there. Yeah, by all means. And I've liked it ever since. We live in the same village, and I've known her for years, and never knew she had macula. So since then, it's been nice, hasn't it, yeah. to come together. At first, I thought, do I really want to be with other people that have got the same condition? I didn't really want to, but now, ten years down the line, I'm so glad, so glad we made that effort. Well, the groups run by themselves, and we, we set them up initially, and then it's volunteers. And a lot of visually impaired people are involved with running the group, but we also have maybe their partners, family, friends, whoever would like to get involved. And the more people get involved, the easier it is for everybody. And uh, so, no, it's, it's amazing. Within two or three months, people are coming in to help um, within the group. I have had it since my late 20s, and I didn't know what it was. And I didn't know for years and years and years what it was. Uh, I must have been in my 50s before somebody told me, because I'd never heard of macular disease. Friends and families have to come to terms with MD too. We work together. I read things out to my automatically, because I know she can't see it. Notices, if we walk in somewhere, there's a notice. I know she can't see it, I read it to her. Don't have to think about that. But a lot of our members are much worse than Mavis's. And quite a lot of them are on their own. Very difficult for them. Very difficult for them. People who are visually impaired are often isolated at home and don't get out very much. So coming to the group does get them out of the house as well. It's not easy when they're first diagnosed because there's not a lot of help out there at the hospital. There's no no visual aid or anything like that at our hospital. They have to go to the local optician uh, for things like that. It is getting better. It is getting, and social services have been very good and sending them to us. I mean, we've gone from eight people to now 60 in the 10 years that we've been going. This is our 10th anniversary. Peer support is so important. I even know from my own experience I learned a lot from talking to someone else who was visually impaired that nobody else could um, answer the questions. Local Macular Society groups can support families and friends too. In fact, anyone can join our groups. We have some groups specifically for younger people with macular disease run by our WAM or Working at Macular section. Dealing with a diagnosis of macular disease as a young person can be very hard. I just didn't have a clue what I was going to do, work-wise, family-wise, hobby-wise, everything-wise just seemed to stop on that day. Stumbled across a lady with a guide dog and she asked me what I'd got and I mentioned the word macula by chance. And she says, oh, there's a group that meets last Thursday in the month. I just couldn't believe that there were other people there in a similar situation to myself and they were telling me the horror stories of when they were diagnosed quite a few years before me. And they were also telling me all the little tips and, and everything else on how to get on with your life and concentrate on the positive things rather than the negative things. and Just little tips, really. That, and I came out of there clicking my heels, thinking, I'm going to do something about this. I'm going to try and find other younger people and help set support groups up for young people. You know, we met up with this motley crew and, and everybody sort of gets on with it and we meet up three or four times a year and we, you know, it's, it's good. You can still go out and do things. That's the main point I want to try and get across.
when you first get diagnosed, you feel really isolated and you think, oh my God, I'm like 14 years old, I've got the eyesight of a 60 year old, what am I gonna do? And you get really lost and you've got no one to talk to. But uh, once I got in touch with Danny and Wham, which I saw on the last DVD, um, um, it, it's just been much more positive and I've helped other people who are a bit younger than me and given them guidelines on how they can deal with it. It's really good to actually meet other people who are getting on with life and actually just have some support about how to access the medical side of things with greater ease and what to ask for, what's okay to ask for and so it's, it's just helpful to have other people. Details of all local groups are available from the helpline. The Society also produces a wide range of publications for members and non-members. Actually joining the Society costs very little and brings extra benefits, including a quarterly magazine. It also helps others and supports the Society's work to find cures and improve the care of people with macular disease. The Society relies upon the generosity of members and supporters to fund all of this work. Fundraising is crucial for us because we don't receive any money from the government. So we rely entirely on donations from members and from other members of the public. Um, we rely on people doing events for us like um, runs okay. and coffee uh, mornings. We have a, a wide well. range of events that people do for us. And without this fundraising, we wouldn't be able to deliver the services that we do. Um, and there would be a lot of people who wouldn't know where to turn to to get help for their problems with macular disease. Events like the British 10K raised thousands of pounds for the society. Uh, well, my grandma, she's alive, had uh, macular disease. She died about three years ago, but I, I kept on um, uh, raising money each year. Um, it's a really enjoyable event, and I think the uh, macular society does does wonders for, for people with macular degeneration, um, including my grandma, they helped her when she was alive. So that's why I keep doing it. My mum and my sister both suffer from um, macular dystrophy. Um, it's something that they've, they've dealt with for years and years and years. It's kind of part of our family life. And to see the way that they deal with it and the help that they get from the macular society and the newsletters and stuff that you send out, I just wanted to, I don't know, to, you know, to give something back and just help out, I suppose. It was a great occasion today, lovely weather, as you can see, and it was brilliant. We, there was three of us who ran together. And Had a girl from work that came yeah, and ran with as us, a guide. To help us as a guide. Um, because obviously, being visually impaired, it can be quite crowded out there on the, on the field. But uh, yeah, what a worthy cause, and it was a, a great day, great day out, sort of raised some money. Some of the money raised by the society and its members helps fund research into macular degeneration, such as this pioneering work developing stem cell therapy. It's hoped it will enable doctors to replace the eye cells which degenerate and die in macular degeneration. The whole project has moved towards turning human embryonic stem cells into the very cell that dies in that disease at the back of the eye. And that a uh, cell has a rather long name, it's called retinal pigment epithelial cell. But it's a middle layer of cells right at the back of the eye which support the seeing part of the retina. So what we've managed to do over a number of years is to use the knowledge we have in terms of how those cells normally are born and developed. Use that knowledge to turn the stem cell into that cell, into that RPE cell. We've managed to produce it in sufficient numbers and we've been able to do a lot of work to ensure that it is the cell that we want, it will do what we want it to do, which is to support the seeing part of the eye. If the research is successful, it will be among the very first practical uses of stem cell therapy, and the project now has major commercial backing. But in the early stages of the work, money donated by members of the society was vital. The Macular Society, at a critical period in the evolution of this whole endeavour, um, gave what I think is probably one of the largest donations uh, any charity has given to a research project of this kind uh, from the size and from its own membership, which was without doubt immensely helpful and kept uh, the show on the road, so to speak. 
We all hope that one day there'll be a cure for macular disease. But of course, if you have macular disease now, you need ways of coping now. Think positive. You will not go blind with macular disease. You will still have your peripheral vision. So if you remember that, there's a lot of things that you can do. If you don't understand something, you must go and try to find out what it is. Once you know what the symptoms are, what the details are, that is highly therapeutic. If in doubt, find out. Bring the Macular Society. People are so kind. People that are most unlikely, they'll, they'll make sure you go on the bus. They'll take you across the road. And my intention is to get as many people out there leading a normal life, a good life, as possible. And I think acceptance of your condition, instead of beating your head against a brick wall and saying that you're going to do everything exactly the same way that you used to do it before you were diagnosed with this condition, that's equally as damaging. I think you have to accept that it is a life-changing condition, but it isn't a life-ending condition. Each person has a different need, but you have to, with the help of professionals, explore what's best for you. Granddad told me when I was very little, there's a mountain in Africa, he's been there in the army, the snow on the top. I didn't believe him until I was in my 20s and researched it. This happened to my eyesight and I wanted to climb that. I would have probably just dreamt about it and remembered his story, but because this happened, I wanted to get on top of that mountain and I, and I made sure I did. I'm pleased to say that having macular disease hasn't stopped me from doing many of the things that I enjoy, such as Last of the Summer Wine, my one-man shows, and being Wallace. What, no cheese, Gromit? It's not always been an easy journey, but it hasn't been the end of the road. Good luck on your journey. <laughs>